More specific, our February 22nd event is on managing risk as the sub theme, the theme, and then the, the cases on toxic substances. We've made a slight change in that, looking at the toxic substance control uh, uh, regime here in Massachusetts. Uh, and that'll be February 22nd in this room at this time. So we look forward to seeing you. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the fourth in our series of this year. The, the topic today is one that I find particularly fascinating, um, and it's, it's a and if managing, in fact, it goes back to a very old dilemma facing communities or societies, however you want to portray it. It's known as managing the commons. Or it goes back to the notion of the, of the famous uh, you know, the tragedy of the commons. That is, there are certain resources, certain kinds of resources that historically uh, societies have try to manage for, to, if you think about sustainability, I mean, the, if we think about, for those of you who don't know, the term Boston Common is actually, was originally going back to its origins as a common grazing pasture. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, it, and it's with any common pool resource, the, the contemporary terminology, uh, there had to be rules for managing the common or else what would happen? Each individual grazer would take his or her cows to the common and without rules about how much time you could spend with your cows, grazing on the common, how many cows you could have, etc. what would happen? You would overgraze the common. You would destroy the resource. And so indeed, societies have long sought structures and rules and norms for managing various commons, whether it's classic pasture land, or timber land, or natural resources in terms of mineral resources, or other kinds of commons. Now traditionally, um, we have oftentimes managed them by privatizing access, dividing up pasture land into and enclosure, enclosing them into privately owned pastures, selling them off, leasing them. Um, or we have done licensing of some kind, or some kind of way of managing common resources in such a way as to both uh, utilize them in some rational way for the moment, but also sustain them for future generations. Fisheries are particularly troublesome. Fish don't stay still. Hence the most difficult problem, in some respect, of, of managing commons you can imagine. Fish are mobile. Um, and so, in fact, imposing traditional rules on fisheries gets very difficult very fast because, for example, uh, you know, what are the rules for entry? Can you just restrict them to, to your people? Well, there's a whole st string of, of, of treaties and maritime laws and, and fisheries laws that says maybe you can't. Or you can fish in the international oceans. Um, and so fishy, fisheries sort of management is, is particularly a nettlesome uh, issue, as we'll see with our guest speakers today. Um, I'll just go over a quick, a quick example, the number of things you can think of to manage fisheries. Um, you could allocate them, you could manage by fishing licenses. Only those with licenses can fish. Uh, then you control the number of licenses in theory. Uh, you can mandate the number of days anybody can fish and, you know, and when they can fish. You can mandate quotas, types of, you know, types of fish you can f catch, how many pounds of that fish you can catch, et cetera. You can technology mandate. You can mandate certain kinds of, 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 of nets, sizes, types. Um, you, know, you, know, you can mandate boat sizes and how many boats. You can do all <coughs> kinds of things. And yet, as we're going to find today, um, there's no easy answer to managing fisheries. And we have a, a, an example of how and how uh, controversial uh, fisheries management issues get when you're in a place like Massachusetts where fishing is still a very big business. Uh, if anybody's been to New Bedford or Gloucester, one understands very clearly how important fisheries are to the lifeblood of whole communities, uh, historically and in contemporary terms. Um, and in the, a couple weeks ago, the federal government denied a uh, request by the state government here in Massachusetts to, um, uh, to have a, an emergency increase and the catch limits for ground fishing vessels in the Northeast. And the, the federal government basically, in the guise of Commerce Secretary Gary Locke, uh, would not raise the limits because the state failed to provide new scientific or economic data to justify the move. This is according to the Boston Globe. Um, and the data do not, are not sufficient to allow an increase in the fishing um, uh, limits that were imposed by the federal government uh, for Massachusetts and the New England uh, fishery, uh, fishing uh, fleets in particular. Um, this was met, of course, as you would imagine, by very strong response by state uh, uh, and local political leaders, the governor's office, Mayor Lang in New Bedford, and uh, Congressman, of course, Barney Frank, 
uh, who, uh, if you don't know, represents New Bedford and Fall River, the area down there, as, as well as, uh, as Brookline, uh, his district being a classic example of, of a very interesting looking district. Um, but he represents an area of the strong fishing interest, and, and Congressman Frank responded in another Boston Globe uh, quote, um, it says that you know, he was very upset about the decision by the, the Obama administration, and he said, uh, called the decision an assault on the industry and blasted the administration's wholly negative tone. He said, if it persists, quote, it will make me difficult to keep cooperating with Obama. So fishing is not a small matter for Congressman Frank because, again, he has constituents whose livelihoods depend on fishing, and he has entire parts of his district that re relies on fishing. And the Boston Globe that same day, January 13th, um, uh, opined, well, not so fast. Um, you know, uh, it's no need to, ca to lift the catch limit, says the Boston Globe, and, and, and it, it, they, didn't, they, they agree with the federal government's decision. Uh, there was no need yet to do so. And besides, said the Globe, the fishermen who are struggling are the ones whose quotas based on their catches in past years are meager. Under the new system, uh, they were supposed to have an option of leasing quotas for, uh, from other fishermen, but they often cannot afford a price that makes sense to other boat owners. Special assistance then would be merited by the Department of Commerce to help those fishermen in their plight, but however, not raising quotas. Uh, was not, raising quotas was not the answer. So uh, you can see that this is an issue of tremendous interest, tremendous importance, and, uh, and as we'll see, tremendous complexity. And we have two guests who I think are, are, are very well equipped to speak to these issues, both as they're rooted in Massachusetts, but also more broadly. Um, and our first guest in the bios were, they were sent out to everybody. Let me just do a quick version of them. Uh, Brian Rothschild is the Montgomery Charter Professor of Marine Science and Technology and co-director of the Massachusetts Marine Fisheries Institute and former dean of the School of Marine Science and Technology at UMass Dartmouth um, uh, down in southeastern Massachusetts in 2003. And he's widely published in the area. Uh, of fisheries. In 2003, he received the American Institute for Fishery Research Biologist Outstanding Achievement Award. In 2007, he received the, um, uh, no, I forgot the acronym, a National Oceanographic and, uh, was it again? Atmospheric, atmospheric Association. That's about, the atmospheric part was what always gets me. Uh, Sustainability Fisheries Leadership Award. Uh, he worked with NOAA for several years, oh, a number of years, 15, 15 years. And in 2008, he received the South Coast Man of the Year Award and is widely known for his work supporting the Massachusetts fishing industry. And he's going to lead off discussing the shift in fisheries regulation from, again, days at sea, a classic sort of mandating how many days at sea you can spend, to more what they call catch shares approach, and a very controversial approach, obviously, and what the effect of that shift has been on, on and how regulation of fisheries can be improved. Uh, our, and, and he will start off, and Tundia Gardi is director of the Marine Ecosystem Services Program at Forest Trends, an, an international organization based in Washington that promotes sustainable utilization of natural resources. She specializes in coastal planning and assessment, marine protected areas, fisheries management, and ocean zoning. Uh, she heads up what's called the Mares, Mares Program Initiative. It's a program looking to protect marine ecosystem services through payments for ecosystem services. I'd like to hear about that. About that. Um, and previously, she's founder of an organization called Sound Seas, a group working uh, at the nexus of policy and science to promote marine conservation. And was seen before that senior scientist for the World Wildlife Fund, and before that at Conservation International. So she has a long history of, of activity in, in important international organizations, uh, looking at fisheries from a global perspective. Um, and so, without, and she's going to follow up after Professor Rothschild and look at regulation of ocean management uh, in a sort of a broader uh, uh, focus in, from, in terms of uh, global management, but also the sort of combination of interests. So, a lot to talk about, and without further ado, Professor Rothschild. Okay.